Uh, greetings. It is uh, July 7th, 2014. Uh, I've been working on a, uh, my PowerPoint of uh, Israel Birnbaum's work, which had been a, a uh, slide class for many years. In fact, my very first presentation in uh, April on April 12th, 1994 in Seattle uh, uh, interwove uh, Israel Birnbaum's work from his series called My Brother's Keeper and My Own Art from the then nascent Under the Wings of God series, now called just Under the Wings Art Series. And, um, and I wrote uh, Israel I found Israel Birnbaum's book around January or February 1992 while I was working on the second drawing in my series. Uh, I wrote him that winter after finding him listed in the Queen's phone book, which the library still had in hard copy at that time. And, um, and then we corresponded for about 10 months, spoke on the phone once, and then in May 1993, I heard from a uh, mutual acquaintance, a now deceased uh, historian and uh, specializing in uh, art of the Holocaust and about artists of the Holocaust and other genocides named Stephen Feinstein. And I found that the Birnbaum had died that winter, which was in uh, winter 93. I did a drawing in response to that called Shema, which is in the Under the Wings of under the Wings series, which can be seen in my Flickr.com album. And sometime uh, after that, I wrote uh, an op-ed length article, which I'm going to read here. It's called Remembering Israel Birnbaum and uh, Teaching the World's Children. So this is written in 94. Uh, Ours was the most unusual friendship as we never met in person, not even once. There was the age difference as Israel was probably 40 years older than I. As for the circumstances of our childhoods, they were as different as day and night. We were both Jewish, but Israel Birnbaum was born into a large observant family in Warsaw, Poland around 1910. I, on the other hand, was born in Manhattan in New York in 1950, far, far from the terror which struck European Jews just several years before my birth. My parents were both born and raised in America. My religious upbringing was liberal reform, not orthodox. Our relationship lasted just short of a year, but is embedded in my pores the way next year in Jerusalem is set in the lips of Jews worldwide at Passover. We exchanged letters and cards. We spoke on the phone, chatting about artistic travails and finding about finding publishers for our relative Holocaust art education projects and about business. And an interjection here, business referring to the marketing and promotion of art, which most artists infamously are dreadful at. Back to the article. You see, I offered to help Israel, although I needed help as much as he. Let me tell you a bit about him. He was born and raised on Muranevska Street in Warsaw. Every one of you who reads this should remember the name, for it doesn't exist anymore. It exists now only in memory, in the occasional archival photograph, in literature, in Israel's paintings, and in the reminiscences of survivors like him. The Nazis destroyed Muranovska Street during the liquidation and the destruction of the Jewish ghetto during the time of the famed uprising of 1943. It wasn't just, I'm going to interject and add, it wasn't just the destruction of the ghetto and its buildings, it was the remaining 50,000 prisoners who were still alive in the ghetto, almost all of whom were murdered. Back to the article. While Israel's childhood was spent on his beloved Muranovska Street, his grandparents and other family members lived on nearby Karmelitska Street. It too is only a memory. Of our different upbringings, worlds apart, language is significant. Israel was raised speaking the Mamalotian or mother tongue, known as Yiddish, the language of Eastern European Jews. All four of my grandparents spoke it. Israel probably knew Polish as well and learned French and English later on as third and fourth languages. Being observant, he was undoubtedly a skilled Hebrew reader. I, like most American kids, learned English as my first, second, and third languages. Call it fate, circumstance, or exceptional luck, but Israel was one of the very few of his family, and I'm going to interject here, I think he was the only one in his family, to survive the inferno known to the world today as the Holocaust. 
Years later, he was especially shocked on seeing for the first time a photo of the Warsaw Ghetto in ruins with a partly obliterated sign from Karmelitska Street in the rubble. That was the street I mentioned where his grandparents lived when he was a boy. He then created a painting called The Warsaw Ghetto Streets, 1943, in the memory of all the vanished streets and buildings. Later, he wrote that Karmelitska Street was especially close to my heart. He married, lived in Paris after the war, immigrated to the U.S. in 1957, worked as a dental technician, and raised three sons. And I realize on reading this article that I didn't mention in the article how he himself survived, which I'm going to mention right now quickly. He had fled east and uh, was in the Soviet Union right around the time the Warsaw Ghetto was sealed in as a concentration and death camp. Uh, was uh, either conscripted or enlisted in the Red Army, the Soviet uh, Army, allied with the Americans and Brits and so on. And at least a part or much of the war, he was stationed in Siberia, which I've told, I've told audiences at presentations for years. From my perspective, it was a, a wonderful place, a fabulous place for a Polish Jew to be stationed during World War II. Back to the article. When his book of paintings and text, My Brother's Keeper, was published in 1985, he wrote that, quote, my first words of gratitude are to the people of the USA, United States. My own life had none of the cataclysmic fear which his had. I studied art in Midwestern universities, moved to Seattle in 1980. I did go to Poland three times in 1984 and 85. Not a frequent flyer destination for Americans looking for summer getaways. I saw vestiges of a once vibrant and flourishing Jewish life in Poland everywhere I traveled. As an artist there, I sketched, talked, listened, and observed. I etched innumerable images in my brain also, many painful. I even lived in a dorm for two weeks, my final stay there, which had been a Gestapo and then a communist police interrogation and torture center. People still gasp when I mention it. I never even told my folks about that until now. And I'm referring to 1994 when I wrote this. In late 91, I began my own major Holocaust art education project, and several months later, I came across Israel's book in the children's department at Seattle Public Library. On reading that he had been raised on Muronovska Street, I became very excited. My own series of 50 drawings, now half completed, with accompanying text, had begun with my drawing from a photo taken in the ghetto between 1940, probably 1940 or 41. It depicted a trolley car in the ghetto, and with the exception of the Stars of David, which adorned its front and rear, it looked similar to trolleys in Poland today. Its destination sign, Mironowska Street. The drawing is called the Mironow Street uh, Trolley in the Warsaw Ghetto. This was a startling coincidence for me. How many Holocaust survivors might I meet? And how many of those were likely to be artists? Of the artists, how many were working on Holocaust themes and using some of the same photos I was using in my own series? I wrote a long letter to him in New York. Israel wrote back that he saw me as a, quote, a young man trained in the modern style, end of quote, and I was fortunate to be able to work freely and to be able to live as I wished, free from the tragedy which befell his generation. He'd wanted to be an artist as a young man, but the Nazis... He thanked me for devoting my energy and time to helping people remember the Holocaust through my art. And for me, Israel was an artistic and spiritual link to the pre-war Jewish Warsaw I would never know with its wealth of artistic, political, and religious diversity. I was moved by his dedication to make paintings, quotes, so that the planet's children could live in security in a world of love, brotherhood, and peace. And I'm going to interject here. This is what I'm about to say is not in the article. There's a, a great deal of altruistic or altruism and idealism that goes into doing what Israel Birnbaum spent doing or what I've spent doing and other artists and educators in terms of the Holocaust. Because as we know, wars and conflicts and hate crimes and hate attacks and genocides have continued on and are continuing on today. Back to my article. Israel began painting with a great passion after his children were grown. He retired to paint full time. 
He told an interviewer in 1981 that he painted in very bright colors so that people wouldn't look away as he was presenting the most horrible of events in his paintings. A year ago, when I found that he had died, I wept. Eventually, I was able to smile. I think to myself, Israel, you did good with your life and you made incredible paintings. You described them to me once as naive, but they are painted with great feeling and hope, something few artists accomplish. Your presentations to hundreds of school children in the Northeast Florida, Germany, and in Israel speaks for itself as a testament of your artistic skills. Israel, your death shows me my own mortality as a human being, a Jew, an artist, and as a man with similar dreams and desires, needs, and gifts to offer. But you have given me a greater challenge for the rest of my days. You gave me hope when your generation suffered hopelessness and the knowledge that we will continue on from generation to generation. Thank you. End of quote. It was Israel's fervent wish that every one of us would ask ourselves, quote, am I my brother's keeper? Thank you. This is a, a, a detail from the monumental sized painting called the uh, Jewish Children in the uh, Concentration and Death Camps. <laughs> 